right, guys, let's get into this conversation right here. Jordan Peterson was having a discussion with an evolutionary psychologist with respect to how women select men. Okay, and I found this conversation so incredibly insightful and so incredibly fascinating that I wanted to bring it up here to this platform. They speak in very complicated terms, and I'm trying to slow it down where I can in order to try to provide more light or more color to the things that I'm hearing. But what's so important regarding this conversation is that there's a lot of talking spoils within red pill communities that are shunned by those of the opposite gender, but in fact seem to be supported by psychologists. So listen up and pay attention. Without further ado. Maybe, maybe we, could, we could start our discussion of sexual differences and mating strategy with that. So first of all, what's the evidence that suggests that women are in fact choosier when it comes to sexual partners than men? And how much choosier are they? Mm. Uh, okay, okay, great question. Well, so maybe first we could def just define for listeners what sexual selection theory is. Uh, Thank you. Most people, when they think about evolution, they think of survival of the fittest and that sort of uh, nature mm -hmm. reddened tooth and claw. Kind yes, of and thing, a kind but... of a randomness too, which, you know, that, that's kind of implicit right. in the natural selection theory, whereas sexual selection is anything but random. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so sexual selection, so if, if natural selection, this is oversimplified, but is um, the evolution of adaptations due to their survival advantage or the survival advantage that uh, accrued to the possessors. Uh, so things like fear of snakes, uh, fear of heights, mm -hmm. uh, spiders, darkness, strangers, and so forth, food preferences, things that led to better survival. Sexual selection deals with the evolution of qualities that lead to mating success. Mm -hmm. And Darwin identified two causal processes by which mating success could uh, occur. One is same-sex competition or intrasexual competition. So being an evolutionary psychologist, they're talking about how we evolved as people and there's different categories within that evolution that has led to who we are today. So they talked about as humans, different fears within our species that have developed over time, which have allowed us to live longer and longer and longer. But then they're going to get into sexual selection as well. And the logic there is that whatever uh, he, he thought about it in terms of contest competition, where there was a physical battle, like two stags locking horns in combat, uh, with the victor gaining sexual access to the female loser ambling off with a, a broken antler dejected with low self-esteem and probably needing some psychotherapy. Uh, but the, the logic was whatever qualities led to success in these same-sex battles, whether it be athleticism, uh, strength, agility, cunning, or whatever, those qualities get pet got passed on in greater numbers due to the sexual access that the victors accrued. So huh, let's say you're on an island, ship comes in from the island, Huh, you go out to war, you go out to fight, you lose said fight. Huh, guess where your lady is going with the victors, okay? Unless she decides that she's going to ride for your honor. Oh, but wait, deciding to ride for that honor means that she might be killed, right? So they have to make decisions within that. So when, we, when I get into the discussions regarding how men love harder than women, could it be that there's an evolutionary capability for women to drop love from one man to another for the promotion of her own survival? The next thing that I thought about is look at all of women groupies around sports athletes, all right? What other form of directly seeing men compete do you have then in sports competition? But then on the flip side, how many men are grouping around female athletes? It's not at the same rate. So the idea of evolutionary psychology is to uncover, well, why does that exist? And a lot of these, why does this exist? It's talked about from a red pill perspective. Let's move on. Uh, qualities associated with losing basically bit the evolutionary dust. Uh, the second component, so that's intrasexual competition, which actually the logic is more general than Darwin envisioned. So like in our species, as we were alluding to, we often compete for position and status hierarchies. Uh, and so we, we can engage in intrasexual competition without engaging in this physical battle or contest competition. Although I think that the contest competition was also part of human evolutionary history mm -hmm. with, yes. with males. The other component process is uh, basically what Darwin called female choice. And the logic there is that whatever qualities, if there's some consensus about the qualities that are desired, 
that men possessing the desired qualities have a mating advantage. They yeah. get preferentially chosen. Those lacking the desired qualities basically become incels or involuntarily celibate. They get shunned, banished, or ignored. So the logic there, if you know, you're a deer, you're a stag, and you got all of the horns and shit like that, the females that see that are gonna want the eggplant, all right? Now, if you don't have it, shit, you just might not get chose. And that's just nature propagating the genes of those that have been passed favorable genes. Same thing for males. Six, what do we say? She wants a dude that's six foot, six figures, six pack, at least six, six stack. And why is that? Because from a genetic perspective, her evolutionary biology wants her to procreate with high level degree of genes to pass that on into the future. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, now, the, the twist on that, and, and, and so I think sexual selection is, is by far a, a more interesting process and definitely has occurred with respect to humans. But the twist there is that we have mutual mate choice, at least when it comes to long-term mating, especially, I should say, especially when it comes to long-term mating. Uh, and, and that gets to the issue of uh, Trevor's theory of parental investment, where he said, he asked the question, well, which sex does the choosing which sex does the competing? Mm. Uh, and he, his answer was the sex that invests more uh, in offspring tends to be choosier. Sex that invests mm -hmm. less tends to be more competitive for access to those desirable uh, members of the opposite sex. But in long-term mating, uh, now we know from our reproductive biology that women have that nine-month pregnancy, which is uh, obligatory. So women can't say, look, I'm I'm really busy with my career. I really only want to put in three months. It's, it's just part of our reproductive biology uh, to produce one child. And men can produce that same child through one act of sex. And so, uh, so women are, at least in when it comes to sex, the choosier sex, the higher investing sex, in part because the costs of making a bad mating decision are much more severe yeah. for women than for men. Yeah, men and true. women hook up, have sex for one night in the morning. They both realize, oh, this is a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Well, if the woman gets pregnant, then she might be pregnant with a guy who is not gonna invest in her offspring. A guy perhaps is someone that uh, has uh, poor genetic material. Uh, it does not have a robust immune system, et cetera. Right. So, so anyway, so, so, that's, uh, that's so, so, so just real quick, I think those are very fair reasons to understand why women are more picky, but here's a question I have to ask. I wonder what happens to a society when you flip the idea of women not being selective from a sexual perspective, and instead you have a media system and engine that pushes the idea of sexual revolution, sexual liberation, the Cardi B's, the Nicki Minaj's, and all of these women that appropriate components of the culture to push sexuality onto the young women. I wonder what happens when their biology says one thing, but then the culture around them says something completely different. No, no, participate in hookup culture. No, it's okay. What's gonna happen, a little STD? Oh, we got medicine for that. Oh, you're just gonna get a little pregnant? What's Planned Parenthood for then? And then you sprinkle on top of that, pandering and delusion. And no wonder we're getting women that are baked and soaked in masculinity and not the femininity that their evolutionary biology wants them to have. Pay attention. I'm going to answer to your question about uh, sexual sel selection. But, so, but, but, oh, go, yes. go ahead, please. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I was just going to say that the you asked about the evidence uh, for females being choosier, and they are choosier primarily in the context of casual sex or short-term sex. So that's where you find the big sex differences. And so one of the classic, uh, and there, there's a ton of evidence for this. This is a, a, a sex difference that, that I capture in the book under the category of desire for sexual variety. Uh, so men have a much greater desire for, meaning a variety of sex partners, uh, than, than women do. And so the choosiness comes in on, I'll, I'll just give you one experiment. This is a classic study done by uh, Elaine Hatfield and Russell Clark, where they had male and female confederates, which uh, for listeners are members of the experimental team. It doesn't mean people from the South United States. <laughs> uh, uh, but they had male and female confederates simply walk up to members of the opposite sex on a college campus and say, hi, I've been noticing you around campus lately. I find you very attractive. Would you, and they asked them, 
one of three questions. Would you go on a date with me tonight? Would you come back to my apartment with me? Would you have sex with me? And it was a between groups design. So they simply recorded the percentage of individuals who agreed to these Great experiment. three different requests. And of the women, about half, about a little over 50% agreed to go out on a date with the guy. Uh, 6% Good agreed numbers. to go back to his apartment. 0% agreed to have sex with him. Most women need a little more information uh, about the guy before they're willing to have sex. Uh, of the men approach, also about 50, by the female confederate, about 50% agreed to go out on the date. 69% agreed to go back to her apartment and 75% agreed to have <laughs> sex with her. And so if you talk about choosiness, um, uh, are you willing to have sex with a total stranger who you've met for 30 seconds? Uh, women unwilling to, and in general, uh, men very willing to. And this is a study that's been replicated now in several European studies. Very difficult to do this as you might imagine, to get... You know, you know what's so interesting about that is that because fe um, the female narrative dominates mainstream media, you know, and to understand that that's how men think, but then to also understand that men are looked down for their preferences or the amount of time that it takes for them to decide that they want to have sex. But if this is reality of manhood, why do we shun it, right? If our biology is such that this is where it is right now. Like, why do we cast it away as some like weird, dirty part of society? Maybe that's just the way that we're built. It doesn't make women better because they choose to be choosier with it. It's just what y'all just choose to do. But I forever hear young women shame young men because, you know, they just want to propagate the soil. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They just want to, to spread their genetics amongst the land. Don't shame us for it. It's our biology. Psychologist said so. All right. Get this by the IRBs or ethics committees in, in the United States anyway. Um, I assume it's similar in Canada. Uh, or worse. In, or worse. So, but yeah, yeah, the kinds of studies we really want to do are, are more difficult to do nowadays. But it, it's been replicated in, in uh, several Western Euro European countries. And you can get women off of the zero percent. You can get a few percent of the women saying yes if the guy's really, really charming. You know, if he's uh, Brad Pitt or, or I don't know what the modern equivalent is, Ryan Gosling, which is one of the, uh, you know, or, or, or perhaps a famous rock star. Uh, so, Or if you take him out of a place where they don't know people, <laughs> right? Go take them to Vegas, right? Right. If you, if you have the chance, they need to do this, uh, changing the geography, right? Like do this test. Cause I guarantee you, if you did it in like a Vegas, if you did it in like a my Vegas would probably be the highest by far, right? If they're not from Vegas, let's say there's some from, from some Midwest town and they're out in Vegas for the weekend, irrespective of having a boyfriend and then coming up to them and saying that shit. I, my field studies have shown that you get like a, tw like, an increase of like 20% from zero to 20%, all right, of the comeback to the room with me. You understand? Okay. All right, let's keep going. So, um, so but that's one illustration of uh, the answer to your question about, well, what is the evidence for female choosiness? Now, the interesting thing, here's, I'll give you one more. So there are studies that ask, what is the minimum percentile of intelligence that you would accept in a potential partner? So, mm. and, and, you, and, you know, we explain percentiles to people so they understand 99th percentile, first percentile, 50th and so forth. And, um, and basically for things like a marriage partner, uh, men and women are roughly equal. They both are very exact. And they say what well, they want, like say 65th, 70th percentile in intelligence, uh, where the sex difference comes up is just a sex partner, yeah. a pure sex partner with no investment. Yeah. Uh, women still maintain, they still want, let's say, 60th or 60 plus percentile mm -hmm. in intelligence. Men, it don't matter. Men drop, you know, to embarrassing levels. Like, doesn't really, <laughs> it becomes irrelevant. The 35th, 40th percentile. They just got to know how to count. You know, if she can mumble a little bit, that's fine. <laughs> or even not. So, Jordan, um, like, stop looking surprised. Jordan, <laughs> stop looking surprised. You know, I'd be forgetting that Jordan is, uh, he's been married since he was like 20 years old or something like that. So maybe he just doesn't know. Maybe he's been out the game for that long. You know what I'm saying? But that should be common sense. You know what I'm saying? And that's where a lot of women, that's another talking point that we talk about in the sector. What women equate 
from a sexual partner or let's say the DMs that they get, the communications that they get, and then what men are actually looking for, they confuse that with their ranking on a marriage marketplace scale, right? It's two completely different things. And the thing is, is like, is he coming at you because he wants your sweet, buttery insides, right? Or is he actually looking at you for some type of long-term play? And the thing is, is like what guys, and they're not really defining it like that, but what guys look for in either or are very different things. So you chicks out here getting on these BBLs and shit like that, you're raising your, I want to pork you market value, but you're not raising your I want to spend the rest of my life with you market value. And you need to understand these things before you make these critical decisions that impact your life. Let's finish up. Of female choosiness. That that is, they maintain greater choosiness when it comes to short-term sex and, um, and, and are simply less comfortable with having sex with total strangers or casual sex. And um, As they should be. Here's, I'll, I'll give you one more now that I'm rambling on, and then, and then we'll get to some other uh, interesting issues. Is uh, This is an item on the sociosexuality inventory that colleagues uh, Steve Gangestead and Jeff Simpson developed a, a long time ago. But one of the items is, that's an attitude item, and it says, sex without love is okay. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? And there you get a large sex difference. So in the seven-point scale where four is the midpoint, uh, men average about 5.5. So they say, yeah, sex without love, yeah, yeah that's okay. Uh, women are, are about 3.5, okay? They're below the, uh, that midpoint. It's another indication um, of this sex difference in, in choosing this. All right, uh, that's the end of the video. So guys, what did you think? Hopefully you left your comments down below and then also give me a timestamp to which particular portion that you wanted to discuss and or talk about, right? There's always this nature versus nurture discussion, which is why I love these conversations from Jordan Peterson, because it helps my monkey brain understand the, (laughs) like what's going on, right? Outside of the observable reality that I expose myself to, the anecdotal evidence that I try to bring on this channel. And I also try to bring some statistics as well, but it's great hearing it from evolutionary psychologists that are dipped in relationships okay that's what we got to utilize these experts for at the end of the day hopefully you enjoyed this video let me know what y'all think questions comments concerns y'all already know what to do me on guitars and reviews at gmail.com until next time youtube